phone or your computer. Uh, you can also respond to the census over the telephone with a toll-free number. And of course, uh, the, uh, the paper response is also acceptable. So um, that's one big project. And that kind of leads me into the broadband task force, which is another thing that we, um, we started uh, working with our planning and community development department uh, and Janice Schweitzer and Jake Brand. Um, we, uh, we know that there's a tremendous need for uh, improved broadband internet service with, through the county, um, particularly in the rural areas. And it certainly impacts people's ability to work from home. This whole COVID situation has only emphasized that. Uh, also, uh, agricultural, um, uh, commerce, and development, so many things uh, are, are now being operated uh, with computer assistance for uh, some of the machinery and stuff that the farmers use. We also have uh, just students that live in agricultural rural areas not being able to do their homework from home and do distance learning. Um, you know, I know many go into a McDonald's or maybe the library uh, or a parking lot trying to pick up someone's Wi-Fi just to be able to get their homework done. And uh, th those are things that really are just not acceptable. And so uh, we currently are uh, waiting for a response back from uh, Eastgate uh, in, in Youngstown. Um, to, to, we have a, a, a three county grant that has been submitted to do a broadband feasibility study in cooperation with or collaboration with uh, Mahoning and Trumbull and Ashbula counties. And so hopefully that uh, will come back favorable and we'll be awarded the funding um, to perform that study. And that will be sort of a, a catalyst for us to then have a, a strategy and be more likely to be successful with applying for other grants when we know the best way to, to stretch our dollars and get the biggest bang for our buck with the investment in broadband infrastructure. So um, always interested in more people joining that committee. Um, we uh, had obviously had to go to, to distance meetings with um, uh, the COVID situation going on. It's always easier, I think, to nice to be able to work face to face, even though this provides us a lot of conveniences. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a little easier to, to share ideas when you can do it in person. So um, if uh, you know of anybody who'd like to be involved with the Broadband Task Force, please feel free to send me a message or reach out to me. And I'd be ha happy to add you to the list and uh, notify you of, of meetings to come in the future. Um, we are looking for folks from all walks of life. So Lorna, if you're interested, was that a hand wave I saw? Um, oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, if anybody is or you know of anybody else who might be, we've got just general citizens concerned about, you know, uh, the access to broadband. We have people that are very high tech level people uh, that have worked in the industry. We have um, uh, providers, internet service providers. Uh, we have uh, just a broad spectrum of folks that have uh, signed up to be on the committee. So uh, let's see. So that's a couple projects. Um, another thing that we, uh, we recently completed um, and uh, this just, uh, let's see, opened up for the county at the very first of the year um, is we actually have a new emergency operations center. And uh, this is something that, you know, again, I think kind of comes into play with this, uh, you know, whole COVID situation. But um, our, our old EOC used to be housed in the basement of the, um, of the, of the new courthouse where the jail is. And um, it had... Uh, you know, no windows, um, limited ability to uh, do upgraded technology. Um, we had, uh, uh, there was some water issues, moisture down there, uh, possibly some mold issues. Uh, it was just not a real conducive place to be for, uh, you know, work eight hours a day. In addition, uh, not a great place if you had to be there for extended periods of time if we had to staff it with an active emergency operations center. So even prior to my um, be, being elected on the board of commissioners, I know there was a lot of discussions from the previous board about, um, you know, trying to secure grants and funding to, to build a brand new emergency operations center. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was concerned about is just the, the cost and the expense of that um, and you know where it would be located and, and being separated from a way of other county entities. Um, so when we, uh, we, we kept revisiting you know, how we are gonna handle this and, and First Energy who had funded emergency operations centers in other communities um, was going through financial problems. So we knew that there wouldn't really be resources there. 
and uh, I think the previous estimates were in the millions of dollars for what they were looking at to put in an emergency operations center. And we just were sure that that wouldn't be feasible. And um, as we begin talking with, uh, with our economic development team of the Growth Partnership, the Port Authority, and the 503 Corporation, um, the growth, they all sort of had talked about trying to um, maybe work a little more collaboratively and possibly share some space and resources. And uh, um, as discussions ensued, there was gonna be room for them over at the old, at the Port Authority building. So they really didn't have the need for their existing building. And uh, um, when uh, Mike Fitchett, who's the director of our EMA, um, reached out and said, we need to find another location. Uh, we said, well, here's one, take a look at it. And he said, you know, there, with minimal improvements, they could relocate over there and it would be fantastic to meet their needs. And uh, so, uh, we were able to acquire that structure as well as uh, retrofit it to meet the needs of the emergency operations center, provide a perimeter of security for it, um, I think for less than $500,000. So we even got um, uh, some grant money to help pay for the generator and uh, uh, offset some other costs. So, um, you know, we, we're really pleased that that's a, a great resource for the whole community to use. Uh, there are many different entities in the county that use the EOC. And then it also, uh, sort of synergized with us having the ability to, to, to mesh our three economic development entities together into one location and make sort of a one-stop shop for economic development with Growth Partnership, the Port Authority, and the 503 all housed in the same location now. And um, mm -hmm. we think that's really been a big asset. And, uh, um, you know, if they've got ideas, they can bounce stuff off of each other right, there, right away if somebody comes in and, um, you know, they may need to complete some paperwork or they may have a need that doesn't quite fit one entity, they don't have to set an appointment to go to another building. They can just maybe go to the office next door. And uh, that mm -hmm. seems to work out real well for them. So, um, so those are, those are a few things that, uh, that I've spent some time working on or collectively we have as a board of commissioners. Um, any questions about those or anything else that I could answer? Well, I did want to say certainly the first thing you talked about the broadband was, I mean, right here, Catherine has to stay in Jefferson, but you know, the contact that she can't go home. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely, I see that as a huge We're not gonna let her go home, Mary, Mrs. Uh, Howell. Never. We're not gonna let her go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I can see that, you know, and I think we've talked about that in the past, but that's a very, very big need. Uh, me, anybody have any questions for, yes, Jessica. I have a quick question. Do hot spots work there? I mean, I know I know Catherine had said that, that she didn't even have cell reception. So we have hot spots. I'm just thinking of students, if they live in these areas, getting hot spots from the schools to be able to at least have some connectivity. Are those working in those areas? So when you don't have cell service, you don't have the ability to use a hot spot or a MiFi, any of those types of devices that you could connect to. Um, typically, so it was a struggle for us. Um, I have my grandchildren live with me. So I had a kindergartner and then Joe was a senior this year. So we were going to friends' houses, to McDonald's parking lot, to the library parking lot, um, just to get assignments at least downloaded so that we were able to then print them off and they would be able to do their homework. Um, fortunately, Joe being, you know, 17 was able to go to friends houses and do a lot of his work at their home using their internet. Um, so it wasn't as much of a struggle, but it was truly a struggle for, you know, having a kindergartner that you had to log in and do everything online. Um, she was not the best student in the vehicle um, and rightfully so. It was, it was a challenge. So um, we got through it. She is going on to first grade. So we're excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me, let me just touch on, uh, you know, a couple of the different solutions, Jess, because there isn't, I don't think a one size fits all uh, answer to the problem in the county. Um, you know, when we think about broadband, I think everybody's first idea is, is fiber lines and the cost to run hardwire fiber is just cost prohibitive to do in an area with the low population density that we have in the county. So, you know, I think strategically, I, I think we'd like to put, you know, some trunk lines down some of the major thoroughfares and maybe create, 
you know, a grid or at least a figure eight uh, in the county that there are major trunk lines um, that, that possibly can be expanded on. But then, um, you know, there's a lot of communities that are using these uh, microwave signals. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of like putting a satellite receiver dish and then do a point to point line of sight uh, signals that maybe don't have the same uh, degree of, um, uh, you know, high speed that you can get, but at least it's going to get some people, get people some access. Um, so, you know, we've got some folks that just, that I know the frustration in some parts of the county where people are paying for, you know, 20, 50, 100 megs, and they're, they're saying those times they'll get on there and they'll get two, or they'll just be kicked off all day long. And um, I, one Do of the big know? frustrations I have is I don't know how the service providers get away with charging for that and then not providing the service. Do we have any idea how many um, homes with school-aged children are impacted by that? Is there, was there anything done towards the end of the school year to get an idea of how many specifically students there's issue with? I have not heard that figure, but that's really a great question. And that probably is something that the, the school superintendents, I can bring up to the boards there and see if they've got a kind of a count on that and who struggled with their distance learning for the end of the year. Um, but no, I, I do not have that figure. Is the state doing anything? Are they looking into expanding broadband for the whole state? They are. There are various um, uh, bills in the place or that are working their way through. Um, some that I think have already been approved at the state level and a few that are still being under consideration. Um, but the uh, uh, there's they all have different parameters. So it's kind of trying to figure it. Say, Jess, your cat just walked in and my dog just walked in. <laughs> Um, so the, uh, uh, there, I think everybody recognizes this from the federal level on down to the state level, that there is certainly a big need for this. So I think you're seeing a lot more money, um, you know, be allocated. USDA has programs. Um, there's, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank now with all the different programs out there, but there's, there's numerous, um, agencies that are doing broadband funding. And so it's just a matter of, you know, what parameters you have to meet to qualify or how much matching dollars you have to provide and then finding the, uh, you know, the right project to match those things up with. It seems like um, with this COVID-19 and we don't know where it's going to go, that there, you really have to address the needs of children in that area. If the school, we don't know what they're going to do. If they decide to do online learning, you know, that I wondered if there, that might be a, a way of getting funding too, because we can't have enough. Yeah, um, there's, there's no question that, uh, that this new normal of how people are learning and doing business uh, certainly has brought the need for this to the forefront. So I think that's going to be one of the catalysts for providing a lot of additional funding because there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities that it creates, even in spite of the inconveniences that it's created for us as well. Right. Um, in regards to the census, is there a cutoff date when it has to be completed that you have to have all that data in? And are you going to have people physically looking things up, tracking people down, or how does that work? Uh, great question. Uh, thank you. Nice to see you, Mrs. Rapoose. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, they've delayed the door-to-door -door work, which was supposed to start in May, uh, until uh, I think 1st of August. They're supposed to start now actually going door-to-door, -door. Um, and they said that they will take it all the way up to the end of October, but they're hopeful that they will not take that long, that they'll be done before that. Our response rate as a county, I haven't looked at the update here in, a, in probably a week, but um, the self-response rate uh, was about 60% um, in the county. And uh, I think statewide is 65, so we're lagging a little bit behind the state. Um, last year, uh, or last time they did the census, uh, it was 65, 70%, I believe. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got some work to do, and especially since you now have these other options of responding as opposed to just sending in your mail, your, your uh, paper co copy in the mail. So um, they are going to go door to door. 
Uh, I know they're already uh, deployed and working on some of the congregate spaces and meeting with them to take some of the, the larger congregate living um, data in person. Um, but they, uh, they have not, my, my understanding is they have not gone door to door yet and they should be starting that the 1st of August. Lou, did you have a question? Um, yeah, well, um, I had a question going back to the broadband thing. Um, a year ago, when the governor in uh, Houston uh, announced that they wanted to expand broadband, I believe they said that they were going to concentrate on what they called the Lake Effect Corridor, uh, which was the I-90 area, um, 60 miles west of Cleveland, and the other area was the Appalachians, which I can understand that. Um, I immediately fired him off a two-page letter uh, asking him why um, there was not that same consideration going to the east as we have the same problem. Uh, and there were also like other programs like already in place through the USDA that they were um, funneling money towards to help these communities. Has Ashtabula County ever had direct contact with the governor about this issue? and the lake effect quarter thing that he talked about a year ago and has have they looked into anything uh, that the usda uh, provides in terms of connection yes um i have ap you, you muted yourself there i'm sorry um yes i uh on our I think it was our second broadband task force meeting. I had the representative from the governor's office, and I can't think of his name right now. Um, and then also uh, Dave Hall, who is the uh, um, the uh, representative for the USDA for the state of Ohio uh, from the president's administration, both be a part of that call and talk about sort of some of the programs that were out there and what's happening. Now, I have not heard about the the, the lake. I'm sorry, that term that you just used for the, the lake corridor or whatever, I, I haven't heard that specifically stated. Um, but I, I know they did a lot of work there on uh, I-90 for um, smart mobility and they, and they put some um, broadband in, but it, it's, you know, it's a lot of that's for, you know, traffic counts and things like that for, for you know, the monitoring on the, on the highway. I don't know that there's a whole lot of benefit to anything that was done there on 90 um, for, the general citizen or any businesses. Um, USDA programs, uh, you know, again, we've, we've looked at these, but some of them, you know, they'll give you $3 million. You just have to have $3 million to match. Well, we don't have $3 million to match. So, um, and, and some of these programs, uh, again, you're, they're competitive. So we're, we're trying to do the, the study first. We looked at trying to fund specific, a few specific projects, but you know, we, we, we have so little real data and, and you know, I guess um, instead of trying to do a shotgun approach, we wanted to really have a strategy going in to make it much more likely that we would be able to receive funding and we applied for future grants. So um, that's where it was sort of recommended that we start with the feasibility study and then move into applications once we know, uh, you know, what, what our needs are, where we can best uh, allocate our resources to get the biggest bang for the buck. I would love to have a copy of that letter, though, if you happen to still have that and could share it with me. Um, that would be awesome. I'd love to see what you sent down to the governor's office. And uh, sure. And that might, you know, that might give me something to follow up on specifically. And then um, there, there's, I think the, I think that the, the, the key is really going to be how can we what are we going to strategize here and how can we leverage the resources that we have? I mean, obviously in the, in the cities, even though, you know, there's probably very little problem with getting connectivity in Conneaut or Ashtabula or uh, Geneva, um, I don't know that there's the capacity to attract any real high volume uh, internet traffic users for business if you wanted to, you know, get into a, trying to attract some tech type companies. Um, so, you know, do we need to, focus more on strategizing to, to focus on business, or do we need to strategize more on just getting any form of reliable internet service to the Catherine Whittingtons of the world, 
um, that uh, don't have anything that they can even function with. And, and, and I don't think, you know, I guess my philosophy is I don't want to pick and choose a winner and a loser. I, I want to try to make sure that we can provide something that's improved for everybody. And so um, I, I don't know the best way to do that. And we're hoping that we'll get some of those answers from the feasibility study. And then we can start identifying some of the projects that have to happen, costs associated with them. And then we can go out and try to target some of these different grant programs, whether it's through the state or whether it's through the USDA or other federal type stuff. Okay, th thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, hey, want to go? go ahead, Casey. Yep, uh, actually, Commissioner Whittington was going to go next. <clears throat> I was waiting to see if there were any more questions for JP. Um, I want to start off where we, July is a great month for um, our Asheville County Crime Enforcement Agency. They have turned a year old. That is our drug task force. Um, if you recall last year when I spoke, we were just announcing its creation and them starting. So I thought I would kind of update you um, on the year that they have had being now dedicated strictly to Ashtabula County and taking the drugs off the streets. Um, we started out with five full-time officers. We now have six full-time officers and two part-time officers. Now those officers not only come from the Sheriff's Department, but from Geneva, Ashtabula City, and Conneaut City. So we are a multi-jurisdictional task force. So we are not just one police department. We are covering the entire county. Um, since then, we have been writing grants diligently and we have garnered over $200,000 in grant dollars to help fund the task force. Um, we still have money outstanding. Um, grants are kind of on hold right now due to COVID. So we still have a couple of those outstanding and we have some coming up that will be writing for renewals. So I do work directly with the Sheriff's Department on writing those grants. Um, so they do come out of this office as well with collaboration with the Sheriff's Department for that funding. Um, they have a Facebook page. So if any of you are on Facebook, it is called CEAS, C-E-A-A-C, which stands for the Crime Enforcement Agency of Ashtabula County. Um, they post after they do any type of large drug busts, they post the press release that goes to the community right there. They also post pictures, the homes, where they've taken the drugs from um, and for their seizure purposes. So you're able to see if it's a neighbor down the road that from you or if it's been a problem house that you've been watching maybe. So these identify the actual areas that they are in. Um, Many have asked if the drug task force took a break during COVID. Unfortunately, drugs did not go down during COVID, so our task force was very busy um, through that. Um, so they did not stop working. The task force continued to work every day through COVID. Um, I have some statistics on the drugs that have been seized off the streets. Um, our, our team has taken off 1,754 grams of methamphetamine, 356 grams of heroin and fentanyl, 82 grams of crack cocaine, 3,390 grams of marijuana, which is seven and a half pounds, 391 oxycodone tablets, 30 hydrocone tablets, 51 units of LSD, and 11 grams of liquid, 30 grams of mushrooms. Um, they have the new thing that we're running into with uh, taking pills off the streets is we are finding that we have pills that are stamped Percocet, but are actually pure fentanyl. 
So unfortunately, this is a new way that um, drugs are being stamped either as Xanax or the Percocet, and they are pure fentanyl, um, which is why we were seeing a spike in overdoses from people using um, pill forms. They've opened 144 cases. We've had 20 fatal overdose investigations with six indictments and four pending today, to this date. Um, we've had one homicide, one kidnapping and extortion. Um, we've served 39 search warrants. Uh, we have 42 individuals that have been indicted, um, not only at the county level, but at the state level on 125 counts. We have 20 individuals that are pending federal indictments as well. We've seized over $46,000 in cash and 79 firearms. So as you can see, they've been extremely busy getting the drugs off the street, arresting dealers, and um, you know, with those cash seizures, that helps offset the operations of the task force that goes right back in once those dollars are released to us. Um, so that helps in the cost to the taxpayers. So we are excited that they are a year old and still going strong, expanding. We, ex we expect to expand to more officers later, hopefully this year, um, definitely before they turn a year old. Um, it will depend on the grant cycles that are going through. So the continuation of making sure we're getting more officers onto that program. Um, is there a question? Okay. All right. Um, next, we've been working, the commissioners created through COVID, um, the Asheville County Economic Recovery Task Force. We meet every Wednesday at one o'clock, virtually, um, not in person. Um, we highlight different businesses that come on and our guest speakers, and they talk about their struggle through COVID and how they are working through recovery. We connect them with resources if need be, if they are in need of that. Um, we have several entities on the call willing and waiting to help. Um, so that has been going on for several weeks. Basically, once we heard that the governor was going to reopen Ohio, we started on getting ready to reopen Asheville County. And this was one of the items that we put together in order to do that. Um, it's been a great success. We've, you know, had numerous businesses that we needed to reach out to um, our state representatives, our senators, our congressmen, um, and go up to the federal level and you know just really reiterate what dollars are needed back here in Asheville County to help those local businesses get back on their feet. We also through this through the COVID dollars through the CARES Act and House Bill 481 um, we are able to take $250,000 of COVID money and put that back into the community and we're doing this by providing a program called Restart Asheville County Grant Program. And it's for small businesses with two or more employees and is you can apply for up to $10,000. Um, the cutoff date is the end of this month. And I believe, um, Casey, what was the number of applications we had as of today? We're right around 45, but we expect that to be higher already. So, it's been well received. It is on our website at ashevillecounty.us. Um, there is a banner at the bottom that you can click for the Restart Asheville County program. So if you know any small businesses, um, have them check out the website and go to the informational page to see if they qualify um, and encourage them to apply. The last thing I want to talk about really is what we do to advocate for Ashtabula County. Um, I talk about always being uh, at the state level and at the federal level, 
but I wanted to give you a kind of update of exactly what we are doing at that level. So at the state level, um, we belong to the County Commissioners Association of Ohio. Uh, Commissioner Kozlowski is the, is, sits on the board of directors as well as the general government uh, committee. Commissioner Ducro sits on the jobs, economic development and infrastructure committee as well as the taxation and finance committee. I myself sit on the general government Health and Human Services, and the Justice and Public Safety. By us being active at our association, we have the ability to advocate for exactly what Asheville County needs are that, you know, are working to get those dollars from the state. We also belong to the National Association of Counties, which allows us to advocate federally for the dollars coming down federally to the state ultimately to Asheville County. So I serve on um, two of NACO's committees. I serve as the vice chair for the subcommittee of the Human Services and Education Steering Committee. And I also serve on their Justice and Public Safety Committee. Um, we're pretty active. We meet monthly on one of our committees and every other month on the other. So with that, CCAO has been very active through COVID and making sure that the governor's task force has exactly what the counties are in need of and advocating for that there. Um, also being active on those committees has allowed me to be appointed by the governor to the Family and Children First Council Advisory Board. Um, we did recommendations on how we could actually take the program and actually make it much more beneficial to the children and families, not only here in Asheville County, but across the state. Um, make it more uniformed throughout the state. We found that counties were doing this program differently for our children and that was, it, it just was not beneficial. The dollars weren't being used um, as, as well as they could have. So um, that was great. We put our recommendations um, in paper and to the governor last November. Finishing that up in January, I was appointed to the Governor's Children's Services Transformation Advisory Council. Um, that kind of got stopped in the midst of things for COVID. Um, we are in back doing sessions now again for that advisory council. We are working on transforming the entire foster care system uh, through the state. So um, it has been beneficial to, you know, I served at Children's Services for 15 years and now I'm raising my grandchildren due to the opiate epidemic. So I kind of have a different unique perspective as a commissioner. Um, so I bring something different to their table than they're used to. So we've been having great dialogue as to what is working, what's not working, and what would be more beneficial to our families. So we are all three very active um, and continue our advocacy for our residents here in Asheville County. Um, that's all I have if anybody has any questions. Um, I don't have a question, but JP under the Zoom group chat, uh, Jessica put up a direct thing to the Lake Effect Corridor. We can check that out. Anybody have any Thank questions? Thank you, Jess, I saw that. Thank you. Good. Anybody have any questions for Commissioner Whittington? No? Okay. Could you, could you repeat the the acronym for the drug task force and I yes it's cease c-e-a-a-c -A -A -C. i'll just add my two cents worth that i'm really pleased to see that they're starting to indict the dealers um, yes i think that's been long overdue it's long overdue and the charges you know if there's a fatality there there's you know charges that go along with with that right so depending on you know how they're tracing them back this team is phenomenal we are getting um great feedback from them they are doing 
great work working together with their informants and other law enforcement to trace those drugs back to dealers and getting them off the streets. Okay, next. AC, you want to? Sure. So uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. Uh, this actually marks the sixth time, I believe, that I've uh, spoken to the League of Women Voters. Um, so a little different this year, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide an update to, with all of you. Uh, and much like JP and Catherine, I'm very appreciative of the gift certificate. I look forward to visiting J-Town soon um, and, uh, and having lunch. So thank you so much for that. Do appreciate that. So I wanted to provide a little bit of an update on a few topics here in Ashtabula County. Uh, first and foremost, I thought I'd tackle uh, COVID-19 and the epidemic that is before us and speak a little bit about uh, much of the work that the county commissioners have been involved in as it relates to um, the coronavirus. Um, so back in March, uh, the commissioners got, uh, you know, got wrapped up in this and got very involved in, um, you know, uh, dealing with the situation. And uh, early on, we actually um, conducted a partial activation of our emergency operations center. And uh, Commissioner Ducro spoke a little bit about the center, but the fact that we were at a new site uh, was very beneficial to us uh, because the emergency operations center um, was much more update and we actually had the space to be able to um, respond to situations more, more uh, I guess, efficiently, you could say. Um, and one other thing that we've come to realize uh, is that we had considerable, not only technology issues in the, in the old space, but also space issues. Um, so as part of uh, the, the pandemic, uh, it, one of the concerns has always been access to PPE, that's personal protective equipment. And the EOC has served as a, um, a, a, you know, kind of a facility to house a lot of that PP, uh, PPE, uh, enabling us to uh, then get that out accordingly uh, to the various agencies throughout Ashtabula County. Um, so uh, that space served to be very fruitful. But early on in the pandemic, we activated the county's emergency operations center. And what that meant, uh, a partial activation, meant that uh, we were able to pull up resources countywide and also from a state and federal perspective. Um, and uh, that opened up lines of communication so that we could uh, get uh, updated and accurate information as quickly as possible. And we're sharing information amongst our local entities, the various stakeholders that are involved. So um, subsequently, the commissioners formed a county call um, that uh, uh, consisted of members of our health departments countywide, um, our hospitals, um, our mental health and drug treatment providers, um, our school superintendents um, and community leaders and so many others uh, that we felt were important to be part of this uh, conversation every single week um, for us to be sharing information, getting updated case information, um, also sharing best practices, um, and uh, of course, uh, providing opportunity for help uh, with each other. Um, so anytime there was an agency or entity in need, um, we were able to uh, respond uh, quickly uh, to get the help uh, to where we needed it to go. So uh, here in Ashtabula County, I think it's important that I do share that uh, the case information as we stand today. Um, here in Ashtabula County, uh, we're at 452 cases, um, and we have have had 81 people hospitalized and we stand uh, currently at 44 deaths uh, and but uh, there is some good news in all of this um, and we've had approximately 370 people um, that have been uh, presumed recovered so those are individuals that no longer um, are deemed to have the virus at this time so uh, while you know we've had 452 cases in our county uh, we've had um, 370 at least uh, recover from this virus. So that's, that's good news. Um, and uh, we need to be speaking about some of the positives right now when we're in a world where we hear so many negative things. So, uh, but also during this pandemic, uh, we've been uh, fielding calls, uh, many calls from residents, uh, organizations throughout our county, uh, and also many businesses. And we've been responding accordingly, working with the county health departments to ensure that uh, if they are looking to have an event, that it's a compliant event. Um, uh, if they're looking to, you know, perhaps get some help for their respective small business, 
Um, you know, we try to get them connected to the, to the accurate resource. And that's why the, the, the Economic Recovery Task Force has been so very helpful uh, because we've been able to get that information out there um, to our many community stakeholders uh, and filter that out to our businesses and community members. Um, so we've, we've quickly learned in a pandemic, communication is uh, one of the most important things. Uh, we need to be able to adequately get information out there uh, to a large number of people. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it certainly uh, has enabled us to, to improve our communication countywide, um, having gone through this. Uh, so, but, but fortunately in our, in our county, um, we've held up strong. Um, here in Ashtabula County, we're at a level one currently, uh, which is the lowest level um, that you could be at, uh, fingers crossed. Um, we have uh, local counties, uh, Trumbull, Lake, Geauga County, um, that are actually at a higher level um, and are seeing more community spread uh, in, in a larger number of cases uh, per capita. Um, so they, uh, of course, are at a higher level. Let's hope that we, we keep it at the level we're at currently. Um, also during the height of the pandemic, uh, we partnered with Community Action uh, to form a 211 call center. Uh, that is still up and operational at this time. So if you're looking to get uh, COVID-19 related information or you feel you need um, resources at this time, uh, 211 is, a, is a, a great community resource that can provide a lot of uh, information for you. Um, even if you're a community member and don't have access to a face mask, uh, 211 um, can actually uh, get one to you. Um, they'll actually deliver a face mask to you. Uh, so it's, it's pretty neat uh, how we've had a community-wide collaboration um, occur uh, to be able to get help to those that need it. Um, I spoke about the PPE. Um, we've been uh, working with uh, you know, the county hospitals, um, the uh, county health department, uh, and other entities that needed access to PPE. Um, the Emergency Management, Management Agency, which is under the jurisdiction of the commissioners, has been playing a very active role um, in getting uh, PPE out. Uh, fortunately, here in Ashtabula County, we're in a pretty good position uh, from a PPE perspective. Uh, the goal has been to get to a supply of, of at least 60 to 90 days, uh, and we're just about there, uh, so that's good. So should we experience um, any type of, of surge uh, in cases, um, we have resources in our county to, uh, to be able to, to react uh, very quickly. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and of course, we've also been working with uh, many of our small businesses to make sure that they're complying with building department requirements. Uh, because uh, we're seeing a lot of these businesses that have had to reduce the amount of seating or make various modifications to their uh, facility to be compliant with public health orders, um, our building department has been fielding many calls uh, to, to really work with them uh, to ensure that uh, they're compliant. Uh, and really that's a, and something that's uh, important for me to share is through this, um, we have been just trying to be a, a, a you know, someone that, that is helping uh, uh, members of our community get through this. Um, and, you know, so many are grasping for information and grasping for help. So we've been an outlet for really getting a lot of that information out there. Um, something else I'd love to speak about is more about, you know, what kind of what the county commissioners do and what we're active in. Uh, if you recall, uh, when the commissioners spoke back in 2017, uh, when we had, uh, um, a new board of county commissioners elected, um, we actually started to conduct uh, various meetings throughout Ashtabula County. So uh, we felt uh, transparency and being open to the people of Ashtabula County was very important. Uh, so we started hope, uh, holding meetings uh, throughout Ashtabula County and we visited just about every township, village and city, uh, which was pretty neat. Um, and every month we'd, we'd visit a new community um, and learn from them about what's going on in their respective community uh, and how can we as a Board of County Commissioners be helpful to them. Uh, and it's important to also note that these meetings were held in the evening because generally um, our, a lot of our meetings occur during the day. So we felt it was very important early on uh, for us to hold evening meetings throughout Ashtabula County allowing the public to participate. And I know some of you, I think even attended some of our meetings and we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, we welcome you to, of course, any of our meetings in the future. Um, while much of that is on hold right now, um, because while we had visited all of the communities in the county, our goal next was to uh, start holding some community conversations um, during the day throughout the county again. And we also wanted to visit schools um, to provide an opportunity to uh, kind of give them an update on what we do as county commissioners 
um, and also allow them to ask questions. But sadly, that's all been on hold at this time. Uh, so we're, we're kind of using outlets such as GoToMeeting and Zoom uh, to get our information out there about all that's happening in Ashtabula County. Um, uh, and finally, another topic that I want to talk about is uh, this year we're, we're tackling the county's comprehensive plan. Uh, so the comprehensive plan uh, actually serves as a guiding document to plan for the future of Ashtabula County. Uh, the county's comprehensive plan was last updated in 2003. Uh, and we're tackling it in, in the year 2020. Um, long overdue, uh, but why is the comprehensive plan important? Well, the comprehensive plan uh, really serves as, again, that guiding document to plan for the future. So we've, we recognize that we have um, many areas for improvement uh, here in our county, uh, and we want to be able to um, talk to community stakeholders throughout all of Ashtabula County and get a better understanding of what they would like to see our county um, to be in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So we recognize, for example, one issue um, that uh, is a challenge for us is new housing stock. Um, we're, we're looking to, to get new housing in Ashtabula County, but the question is, where do we put that new housing stock? So uh, the comprehensive plan uh, will be part of that conversation to be talking to, to um, various communities, but also community leaders and residents um, and hear from them about where they would like to see perhaps some new housing um, uh, developments put, put up. I know there's been talk of some new housing in the North Kingsville area. Uh, there's been there's talk of um, redevelopment in many aspects of Ashtabula City and specifically the bridge, you know, along the, the, um, the Bridge Street area. Um, so we want to be having these com uh, conversations community-wide about uh, where can we, um, you know, bring in some new housing stock um, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, continue to improve the, uh, the, uh, uh, our, 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 our community lifestyle here in the county. Uh, and then we also talk from an economic development perspective. Uh, what, uh, uh, perhaps what areas are right for development? Um, where would we like to see um, perhaps some more commercial development? Where would we would like to see perhaps more agricultural development and so on. Uh, so we'll also be having that conversation as part of the uh, community planning um, project uh, so that uh, we can, uh, of course, address these issues and have this guiding doc. This, this document serve as the guide for, for us moving forward. Um, and the comprehensive plan is also very important because it allows us to also work from this to secure grant dollars for various projects. So uh, much like Commissioner Ducro said, we're working on the broadband project. Well, uh, also as part of this process, we'll probably be having a conversation about broadband and where, um, where perhaps can we see some improvements uh, to our broadband and technology capabilities so that we could see commercial development or residential development in a respective area. So we're really excited to be tackling um, the comprehensive plan project this year. And we certainly hope that many of you uh, will be part of that conversation. Um, many a times, uh, you know, you may be reading about these things, but you don't know how you, you know, how you can be involved. Well, certainly you can be involved and uh, the comprehensive plan process um, really encourages public participation. Uh, so uh, we hope that as this process moves forward, um, that, uh, that you uh, would be interested in participating. Uh, and we expect most of those meetings to be conducted remotely, uh, probably not in person. Uh, there'll probably be some in-person meetings, um, you know, perhaps if we can start having those again um, into the fall. Uh, but I would assume that most of them will be done remotely. Um, so that should make it easier uh, for people to participate. So, uh, so that, uh, that's another project we're tackling among many other things. I'm sure you're seeing a lot of the, the positive economic development uh, projects underway here in Ashtabula County. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, you know, some development uh, off the shore of Lake Erie. We've got uh, talk of some new hotels. Um, so we're really excited about these new hotels coming up in our county. Um, Tourism is a, has been a $400 million industry for us countywide, and we've recognized that we have a shortage of hotels in our county, uh, interestingly enough. So um, we're excited to see uh, these hotel projects moving forward, um, among many other things. So we all covered a lot of topics, and I'm sure uh, many of you probably have some questions. So we would welcome any questions you may have. Um, yeah, this is Lou Baylog here. Uh, I have, you mentioned like communicating with the residents and asking for input. Um, I noticed on the um, county or commissioner website there, there used to be something called Ashtabula County Insights. 
which was supposed to be a monthly newsletter that highlighted maybe different departments in the county, but also let people know what the commissioners were doing. Um, I noticed that monthly newsletter has not been up, up since April 2019. So maybe that would be a good avenue uh, for to put that information out there and to get um, citizen participation then. Uh, if you could maybe think about reestablishing that on a regular basis. Um, and, the, and the same goes too also like with the agenda and minutes. I mean, like you mentioned, a lot of people cannot attend the, you know, the meetings. Um, and if we could get the agenda and minutes posted regularly, that would give us an opportunity also, I think, to, um, you know, sort of get a vision as to what is happening. Sure, no, uh, a great, great question and great point. Uh, so we do uh, post our agenda and meetings uh, online. Uh, I know our clerk uh, has tended to uh, get those on there, but I think she got a little bit behind uh, just because she got consumed in some other activities. But we uh, do certainly strive to get all of that posted online. Uh, so uh, I haven't checked in the last few weeks to see if it's uh, entirely up to date, but uh, uh, we strive to get that information up there and we'll certainly uh, I encourage her to get that to, uh, updated to our most recent meeting. Um, now, in terms of the newsletter, so the yeah, the newsletter um, hasn't been updated recently, uh, but we've kind of we we've also shifted um, in terms of you know our communication, our means of communication. So I don't know if many of you get the Gazette newspaper, uh, but uh, each of the commissioners actually have a column in the newspaper uh, and provide various updates on many of the county initiatives. Um, so uh, that also has become a, a greater outlet for us to get information out there to a much wider audience. Um, the Gazette has a, has a circulation of over 10,000 people. Uh, so I encourage you to, to also check out our, our, our Gazette news column. Um, and uh, we also have been, of course, having our various community meetings, uh, updating residents on what's happening. Uh, but uh, we'd love to get the, the website or the uh, newsletter back up and going too. Um, we run on a very very small uh, budget and a very small operation, but uh, um, we we certainly want to get as much information as possible. Um, so we'll 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 do our best to see if we can devote some some staff time to to get our to get our newsletter back up and going there. <clears throat> okay, thanks. I just wanted to, to interrupt just a second that I did receive an email that tis only me is Margaret Bissler and she doesn't have a, a, a speaker, so we're, we're glad that she's joined us and so. Um, Okay, Anne, I think you were interested in some things as far as the comprehensive plan you had talked about. No, I'm just happy to hear the update on it. I know s several of us in the league worked on the last one and um, I really enjoyed that. I think the citizen input was a imp really important part of it. And I know after it was all done, even though it was kind of an ar arduous process at some point, um, I looked at other some other county plans and our, I was very proud of how ours turned out, I think really reflected the county. And I, you know, even though it's outdated at this point, I, if you read it over, you can see where a lot of the things that we were hoping for have come to pass. So, um, and I'd encourage you to reach out to um, more, a lot of more younger people too and get them involved in this. So. I, I think I was one of those involved in that other one and, and uh, worked on the green space part. And I know that our um, county park system is certainly with the levees is, is doing much better. We were just at one of the parks today, actually. Um, but I think that definitely has to be a very important part of the, the comprehensive plan is to keep green space, not just empty fields or something. But. Uh, I agree entirely. Uh, so we certainly welcome your participation. And the key to uh, success with the comprehensive plan is not only get the participation, but also uh, do something with the plan uh, and not let it sit on the shelf. Uh, so that's going to be key uh, as we work to get this develop uh, this plan developed. Um, let's uh, let's get good participation, but let's also act uh, to to implement our plan. And how are you how are you getting the word out to encourage people to contact you if they want to be on the committee? So uh, we're not quite to that stage yet because we. Okay. Are uh, finalizing um, uh, the, I guess you could say, review of all of those that uh, submitted uh, to us to uh, 
do some of the comprehensive planning work for our county. So uh, the, the committee has yet to make a recommendation on the firm that we're going to be working with. Uh, but as soon as that's selected, uh, we want to kind of, you know, of course, get some dates out there and provide an outlet for, uh, for you to sign up to participate. So uh, stay tuned. That information will be coming shortly. And how much are we spending for this firm? So uh, we don't have a we don't have an exact cost. We set aside um, one hundred thousand dollars for the comprehensive plan, uh, but our goal is to do a lot of this in house. Um, sure. So we want to of course, be able to reduce the cost as much as possible. Many mm -hmm. other communities have spent much more than that. Um, so we're um, obviously trying to do a lot of it internally uh, in our community services and planning department uh, to reduce the cost as much as possible. Can I make a quick suggestion? Uh, not that I think we could do anything like that on our campus at Ashtabula, but Kent State does have a graduate program in planning. And I know Baldwin Wallace has some programs also, both graduate programs and undergraduate that might be useful um, to tap into. I oh, would, would love to have them involved. Uh, so if you have any contact information of the sort, we'd love to make a connection. I would like to have two updates. Um, I was wondering how the county's recycling program is going and an update on um, the future of the jail. Sure, so uh, does anybody want to respond to the recycling or you want me to? Casey, I'll let, I'll let you do, I'll let you do recycling and then can see you on the solid waste board. I'll take a stab at the jail if you want me to when you're done. Okay. okay. So uh, the recycling program has been very successful in Ashtabula County. Uh, we, we think it's going very well. Um, the system is healthy uh, financially uh, and also knock on wood, for the most part, people are using the recycling program responsibly. Um, we've had a few problem sites uh, where we're noticing people drop off garbage um, in our recycling bins um, or they're dropping it right beside the garbage bins. So of course we discourage that. Um, this is not a trash program, this is a recycling program. Um, but uh, we put the cameras at many of our sites uh, to reduce uh, the abuse of, of the um, recycling centers. Um, and uh, the city, Asheville City was also another uh, area where we're having some trouble, uh, but they're making some modifications, including moving the bins inside a fenced area um, to help contain um, uh, some of the pollution that's occurring around the sites. Uh, but we're, we're noticing a high quality um, in terms of the people that are dropping off the recyclables, um, good plastic, good paper being deposited. Uh, and we're actually even looking to grow the number of sites. Uh, Kingsville Township is the most recent entity that uh, reached out to the commissioner's office and would like to have their community have a recycling site. Um, so we're excited to be working to, with them uh, to secure that site. Uh, and it's really important to, to make it known to everyone that we're one of the few programs in the state of Ohio that still allows you to recycle glass. So if you have glass that needs recycled, um, you can actually use the county solid waste district um, to be able to rid of yourself of that glass. So thanks for asking, uh, Cindy, but the program's going very well. So I'll give a shot on the uh, community corrections project, um, but I'm sure I will uh, uh, overlook some things and hopefully Catherine and Casey can chime in. Um, the, uh, the holdup on the project that currently, I guess, is we, uh, when we went out for, um, the architectural firm to get us some ideas on the cost. We originally had had an estimate that we felt comfortable with. Um, and when the, when the results came back, um, the project was um, estimated to be far more expensive than we had anticipated. And um, we immediately knew that we would not be able to fund the project at the level that, uh, that they had determined um, uh, the original estimates back. So uh, that, that sort of put the brakes on things initially when we had hoped to, uh, to have it on the ballot last fall. Um, then uh, we begin the process and, and Lieutenant Kimmerly from, he's the jail administrator, he really deserves the bulk of the credit uh, for all of the work to start to um, look at reconfiguration, um, look at ways to save um, costs on operational, um, you know, long-term expenses, uh, as well as just construction expenses. 
um, while still allowing it to be uh, something that could be could be constructed and not just meet our immediate needs, but hopefully meet the needs of the future uh, with potential, um, uh, you know, utilizing it for, uh, you know, other facilities that could maybe rent the facility to, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, my wife just popped in the door here. So, um, and, uh, uh, and then um, look at the, uh, huh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. The um, flexibility of it, as times are going to change, how we do corrections, we have a lot of uh, different different types of programs. We, we we're hoping to do more with, um, you know, rehabilitation and getting people back into be productive citizens of society. Not changing from the philosophy of, you know, lock them up, throw away the key, and when it's time for them to be re released, all of a sudden they're going to be good community citizens again. Um, so, uh, as we we are we are getting to a point now where I think we've got uh, the the project down to uh, a dollar amount that I hope will be manageable, um, and uh, and now we have some other preliminary things that have to be put together before it's going to be able to um, to be able to go onto a, uh, the ballot and be presented in front of the voters. Um, we're also trying to. Um, we're also trying to look at uh, we're also trying to look at other avenues that we can use to decrease the overall cost of the community. We've really committed to trying to um, do this more funded with a with a sales tax than with a property tax. So property owners here are not bearing the burden of that and uh, needing to do that with. Um, as a community corrections levy that specifically would be used for those purposes and wouldn't be something that would be used for other, um, it wouldn't be money that would then go to other things. It would have to be used for community corrections purposes. And if we can do it as a sales tax, we recognize that because our tourism industry is growing so much, we would then have the ability to have out of town visitors come in uh, through the use of sales tax and try to help offset a lot of that expense as opposed to um, it all being on the backs of local citizens. So I think those are the few of the of the high points. It's certainly not a dead issue. Um, it's going to be something that we're going to have to continue to work on, um, but uh, it's it's a it's a really complicated project and um, you know we uh, uh, we're, we're continuing to talk about it on a regular basis. Good. Thank you. Talk Catherine, about Casey. Okay. I was just going to tag on very quickly on that. I think it's really important to make clear that it's, it's something we don't want to rush. And one thing we've realized in, in government, it's easy to rush things through uh, perhaps sometimes uh, and not be methodical and think, think this through. Um, so while it's taking a little time, uh, if we do this, we want to do it right. Um, we don't want to uh, rush to get something on the ballot to hope, you know, something will happen. Uh, we want to be very methodical. Um, and work through this the best we can. We want to be most efficient with tax dollars, and we want to be able to create a facility that's going to plan for the future. Um, I never like to call it a jail, uh, to be quite honest with you. I call it a community corrections and rehabilitation facility. Um, I think that's really important because we're talking much more than just incarceration. Um, like JP said, um, we're not going to jail our way out of this problem in our country. Uh, that's not the solution. Uh, but I will tell you, um, we need to be able to have the resources in those facilities to get people the help they need. Because um, unfortunately, right now, the system we have uh, is people cycle through our jail. Uh, they'll check out and they'll come back three, four, five, six months later. Same thing, recurring theme, spend a year or two in jail. Um, we got to change that uh, because we as taxpayers continue to foot the bill um, by having those same people cycle through. But if we have a facility that can actually meet the needs of our community um, and allow us to offer treatment services in that facility, in a secure facility, while they're there, they've got nothing else to do. Um, we want to be able to get them the help to address their drug issues. Many of them have mental health issues, um, medical issues, um, and you know, also working with them to, to help them become productive members of society. Maybe that's getting their GED or some type of specialized training. Let's, let's help these people become productive members of society, not another statistic. Donna, did you have a question? 
Uh, yes, I kind of had two. One was you were talking about economics with this to Casey. And I just wondered, have you seen or what do you know of the economic impact of COVID on our community with the shutdown? Um, what kind of an impact that might have on the budget plans that you originally had? I can tackle that and perhaps Commissioner Whittington will have more from the Economic Recovery Task Force perspective. Oh, okay. uh, but uh, I guess from a county perspective, we haven't fully realized what COVID-19 has had um, overall in terms of an economic impact on our county. Uh, that is still yet to be determined. Uh, but I can tell you um, that our county took a, a dip. Um, our sales tax numbers, we, we noticed a decline. But to be quite honest, we're not noticing a decline at the level we initially projected. So we hope that that's a recurring theme uh, and that uh, that means that people are uh, still spending in our communities. Now, there's a few things that we can speculate on why that's the case, while our sales tax numbers haven't, haven't dropped. Uh, partly, I think it's because we noticed a lot of people get on, got on unemployment and also had the, the federal um, bonus. Uh, so uh, some of the speculation is that uh, many members of our community had that bonus and they spent the money, which is good. I mean, we wanted to see them spend that money and have that go into our local economy. So it's going to really be interesting to see um, since that ends at the end of this month, unless Congress acts and makes any form of extension, that money is going to disappear. So I'm really curious to see what our sales tax numbers look like in probably uh, you know, July or August, September, October. Uh, but the state gets that information to us three months behind. So that makes it hard for us to plan from a budget perspective. So um, you know, we're, we're gonna continue to work from the numbers that we have now. Uh, Janet Disher, our budget director and county administrator is going to uh, provide a kind of a mid-year review for us later this month. And we hope to have some better information from the state so we can plan accordingly. Uh, for the rest of our budget year here in Ashtabula County. But great question. Okay, and I wondered how the lodge is doing, which, um, and since I live in Geneva and we drive by, it's been kind of empty and maybe hopefully it's starting to fill up because I know um, they've been trying to look at, I think, repaying the loan. So this year might not be a good year for that, but I wondered if you had any thoughts on how they were doing with the loan repayment and how the tourism do is there any information about how tourism is going or is that still kind of lagging the information Lisa, I mean I, I just Miss Sal I just want to excuse myself I'm going to call on my cell phone so I'll be mobile but I got to be on the move so I'm going to sign off from here and I'll dial back in when I get to the vehicle because I want to stay a part of the conversation as much as I can so Thank you so much for having us. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions in the future. And I look forward to hearing you guys answer that question, Casey. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Wainton, you, do you want to say anything or want me to respond? So in, in regards to the um, economic piece to it, we are still learning what each business is going through. We only have one or two businesses a week. We haven't even gotten through all the different types of businesses. Um, this week we have, uh, we're looking at grocery stores. Um, you know, our arts and entertainment has taken a huge hit. Um, the Asheville Art Center is just opening back up. Um, you know, when, when you're talking about payroll impacts and things like that, that impacts the city's and the county's bottom line numbers for their general funds. Um, you know, we had the diner on and early on the Jefferson diner and they were at $12,000 um, just in losses and we weren't 30 days into COVID yet. So we really don't have an overall picture yet. Um, COVID obviously is still having a huge impact on our businesses. There are many residents that are still not leaving their homes to go do things. You know, they've, they're still shopping online. They're not going to church. They're not going to the restaurants, even though they're back, you know, open. 
We've had a lot of businesses that changed how they were doing businesses and what they were doing. So we had a lot of restaurants um, go from dining in to carry out. Um, they got creative and things like that, you know, changed menus around and made things easier like that. So some, some are experiencing a huge impact to their business, whereas some are impacted very little, but have changed the model of how they do things. Um, so really, I don't think we're really gonna see a true economic impact until the end of this year and really, I don't, if COVID, if, if this pandemic continues and we are still at limited restaurant capacities and things like that, I don't think we're truly going to see what the impact is until it's all over. Okay. And in, in to tag on uh, to Commissioner Whittington, um, as it relates to that, the lodge is a very similar situation. The, the lodge um, shut down for a few months uh, and we actually mirrored uh, what the other state lodges did. Uh, so we okay. shut them around the same time and reopened uh, the same time the state lodges reopened. We now, were a week delayed in opening. Um, we, we opened a week after most of the state lodges and that was because we just were not ready. Um, and it was better to take a few extra days to get ready. Um, you know, the restaurant was impacted. It's still not um, to capacity. So we're still seeing that um, downturn in those types of items still. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, though, recently we've noticed that the lodge, and especially on the weekends, we're seeing close to 100% occupancy, which is great. Oh, okay. So okay. That's good news. Um, now, it's not normal occupancy because we don't have 100% of the beds open uh, because... Okay of staffing, reduced staffing and things of that sort, but we also have reduced costs. So um, fingers crossed that we'll still continue to see people come out uh, to the lodge uh, and enjoy it safely uh, and complying with social distancing and wearing your mask when you're able and, and all of those things. But uh, uh, things are looking up for the lodge um, because we're seeing uh, occupancy get back to the, the level that we normally would see it at. Uh, but obviously we had those few down months that is going to hurt. Right. Yeah. We also aren't renting every room. So when we talk about 100% occupancy, it is a reduced because of the cleaning protocols that we ha are, have in place there. Um, so you're not going to rent the same room that day. Um, proper cleaning and sanitizing can't happen. So when we talk about 100%, we are at a reduced rooms and that is due so that we can get the proper cleaning and sanitizing done um, throughout the facility, throughout those rooms and get them re-rented once those are fully sanitized. Okay, and, and that's good to know. Thank you. Um, are the cottages that were built, or is that part of, considered part of lodge renting too? It is, yes. and they are open as well. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I have uh, one more question, if I could. Um, what is what is the commissioner's approach uh, regarding all of the beach erosion? Is there anything in place about how to address that situation? So uh, it's an issue. <laughs> it's a big issue, uh, and has been for a few years. Um, so. There are some discussions underway right now uh, to see what we can do to, to assist uh, with this issue in our county. Um, I never realized how expensive it is uh, to address uh, some of the erosion issues. It could be up to $1,000, $1,000 plus per foot uh, to address erosion issues along uh, a Lake Erie shoreline. Uh, but uh, there are is talk, I'm, I'm hearing some chatter of, of some potential opportunities for funding to help uh, with this. Um, we're gonna need it because um, it's gonna be a very expensive project to tackle. Some homeowners are tackling it personally right now um, and it's coming at a large expense. Uh, right now under state statute, we do have the opportunity to partner with one of our economic development agencies to actually work with them to secure some grant dollars to offset some of the cost 
uh, but that means the difference will, will likely be um, certified to their tax bill. And we're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of these properties. Um, some of the homeowners don't wanna spend that. Um, so it, it's, it's that delicate balance of, of finding some funds um, that could serve as a considerable match to help many of our um, landowners along the lakeshore uh, to address the issue. Uh, but we're really gonna need we're going to need more support than what we're seeing right now from our state and federal, um, uh, I guess, uh, governments to, to help with this. Um, Geneva on the Lake, as you probably saw, has had some issues at their township park. Uh, the, levy, the levy funds haven't quite come in from the, the newly passed levy to help, uh, but as soon as those funds come in, I know from talking to Geneva on the Lake officials, they plan to tackle that as soon as they possibly can to address those issues. Every single day, you're seeing more land um, crumble into the lake. It's really sad. Um, so, but uh, we are aware of the situation. We are working um, to try to address uh, some of those issues, but we need access to, to more federal funds to help us. And unfortunately, right now, it's not a priority for our federal and state governments because they're talking more about COVID-19 right now, it seems. So. I saw right. that uh, Sunset Park in North Kingsville also closed due to the uh, erosion there. That's correct. Um, I have a question. Does the, do you as county commissioners have anything at all to do with the Petman plant going in down at the harbor that seems to be rather controversial? So the, it's actually a city project. So in terms of a, of a perspective of, you know, maybe city permits or things of that sort, a lot of it's been going through the city, including tax incentives. Um, has been going through the city. So the commissioners have played a role in assisting with some of the roads. Um, we, we created a, uh, a, a, Catherine, I believe it's a, a, t a uh, TID, TID. TID, Transportation Improvement District. A transportation Improvement District to help with some of the roadway needs. Um, so I know that was making its way through, uh, but uh, um, the project, most of it has gone through the city to be quite honest with you. Um, and I recognize that there's been um, some concerns from an environmental perspective uh, that have been shared uh, and uh, we've had an opportunity to weigh in. Um, now, I would note that the EPA is a, a very strict, <laughs> a very strict agency um, that oversees uh, many of, uh, you know, in terms of pollution and things of that sort, oversees that in our, in our country. Uh, and anytime I've had ever had to deal with the EPA, it's never been an easy thing. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, necessary safeguards, uh, I have confidence in our EPA, uh, but I recognize at the end of the day, we have to have a balance. We got to balance economic development with protecting our environment. And I feel that, that we could do that. <clears throat> uh, does anybody have a question, Lou? Uh, no, just want to thank them for the recycling thing. We're avid recyclers, so uh, we're glad it's back. Yeah. You know, I live in Jefferson, and so we're very fortunate that we have it. Every other week, we put our little container out. and Hopefully, they take it and do something good with it. I don't know. <laughs> and along those lines, uh, the commissioners do plan to host, as part of the Solid Waste District, a hazardous waste collection this fall. So stay tuned for the dates on that. Um, the, the, the date is still being finalized, um, but we still plan to have that uh, COVID-19 friendly uh, for you to be able to dispose of your batteries, your, your paints, your bulbs, and, and things like that that you normally can't rid of in your regular trash. Donna or Cindy, go ahead, Cindy. We really need to include tires in that hazardous waste. I mean, they're dumping them on our property all the time. so. Maybe if the county would collect tires, that would stop some of the trash. But I also have a question about what is happening at the airport. JP, you're on. Okay, I'm here. What's the question? <laughs> what is, can you give us an update on the airport? Well, um, the, uh, the airport has remained uh, very active. They have maybe one of the most active boards in the county as far as meeting regularly and trying to be proactive to uh, um, uh, be productive in their role as, a, as an economic development driver, as a transportation infrastructure entity. 
um, they uh, some of the projects that they are working on. They uh, they recently had a um, the first uh, aviation education class completed. Um, there had I think they started with about forty students signed up, and I believe ended up graduating somewhere in the mid twenties. Um, that uh, funding for that program was all provided through a private donation, so no participants had to, uh, you know, fund for their own education of it. Um, and uh, they they had an opportunity to go through, I think, an eight or ten class session that um, culminated with a with a half an hour or an hour uh, actual um, experience in flight uh, on a plane. And um, they're also uh, actively working on uh, trying to secure a contract with a medevac provider so that we can have um, life flight accessibility from here in Ashtabula County um, to uh, you know, the varying entities that provide uh, uh, not stage one trauma centers, but uh, you know, the, the, the metro hospitals and the places of the world where you go if you're in a tragic car accident and you have to can't get the, the care that you may need um, here in Ashtabula County. So, um, you know, that would be a huge uh, benefit, not only for, for public health and safety locally, but also um, for uh, a revenue generator because uh, th those, those helicopters burn a lot of fuel and, um, and, they, uh, and they do fly pretty regularly. And we're, we're in a a pretty central location here to to several of those type of hospitals and uh, I have a lot of a rural territory to cover so um, the airport also because that helipad that they have is a landing spot for um, for life like currently when it can't get into Ashville County Medical Center uh, also um, for the uh, search and rescue for the Coast Guard if uh, they need to refuel while they're doing search and rescue out on Lake Erie um, those are a couple of the other really critical things that they that they provide. They just recently uh, secured a grant, and I believe are in the. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's in the bid phase or if they've actually gotten to the construction phase yet of putting um, a broadband internet a dedicated line right to the airport. So that's one of the things that they were lacking for a long time was reliable internet for, uh, for, uh, service. Um, we unfortunately had to uh, reduce their budget appropriation when we went through our COVID uh, uh, budget reallocation because of the reduction in revenue. Um, so we, uh, we had to cut their budget about $100,000 from what they were originally um, appropriated. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they have been very fortunate to have uh, some private donations that have helped, uh, foundations that have assisted. The Morrison Foundation recently provided them with... Uh, a grant and um, you know they've got a beautiful new runway it's uh, the only um, fleet compliant C2 report in uh, compliance in the state of Ohio uh, uh, there's jets coming in there um, pretty regularly uh, a lot of folks coming in from there this truck world project um, save a lot uh you know she flies in and out of there regularly uh, uh delta railroad um so you know it, it it's probably not known to the general public how much that place is really used but we really wish we could see more activity out of it and hopefully uh we can find uh opportunities for more general aviation folks to use it not just the big uh corporate entities I hope that helped answer your question, and I'll take any others if this, there's something specific about the airport. Okay, are there any other questions at all for the commissioners? I'd like to just touch on the tire question. Okay. So we had a tire collection scheduled for this past spring, but due to COVID, that had to be canceled. Um, COVID just kind of really threw us all for a loop. Um, our, we are planning another tire collection, but I don't believe that is going to be until spring of 2021. So there will be one, it's just, we, they're expensive to recycle. It's an expensive program. Okay, 
anything else from anybody? I was just going to say if Cindy's getting a lot of tires on her property, hopefully you won't have a limit as to how many they can recycle. They can just bring all of theirs in. <laughs> Divide them up amongst your friends. <laughs> That's a good idea. I think it's a max of four, isn't it? Usually at the at the Ten. recycle events for yeah. tires. Uh, we had four, four for free, and then a dollar from the fifth to the tenth. Yep. So again, bring your friends. Yeah. <laughs> Load them up with your tires and Great. four at a time. Okay. Are there any questions from anybody else? This has been a, an hour and a half, and this is great. Um, I certainly appreciate the commissioners giving us the information that they have. It's all good information. It's all something we'd like to know. Jess, I'll have Jess go ahead. Yes. I just, we did record the session at least like halfway, maybe like five minutes into when JP started the session. Just wanted to ask if that's okay to share. Um, I wanted to get commissioner's permissions before we post it anywhere, send it. There was a few members that had asked us, um, can we, can you try to record it? I've never recorded anything, but if this works, can we also uh, share it on our Facebook page and share it to the members that weren't here tonight? It's fine with me. Yep. All, pu all public information, so. All right. I just want, I want to make sure before I go and do something that I'm not supposed to, so thanks. If there are any tough, tough questions, maybe not, but. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty easy, it was a pretty easy night. Thank you. <laughs> and I and, do and Jessica, to... thanks for the courtesy of asking too. I appreciate that. Of course, there's no problem with sharing it, but we appreciate you asking. Absolutely, sure. And I just want to go on the record for saying, I missed the pie tonight. I know. <laughs> We I look forward to that every year. <laughs> last week was, or last month was supposed to be our annual meeting where we were going to, I don't know, what were we going to do? Tour Hubbard House, I think, and have a meal and all Moore's, of our Moore, Yep, it was catered by Moore's. We had everything set yeah, up. Yeah, so, yes, this is this is disappointing, but we, we live with it, so. Well, it was great to see everyone. Yeah, we yeah. certainly want to thank all the commissioners. I want to thank Jessica for being able to do this without her who knows what on earth this would have come up um i have organized a two or three zoom things but this has been a big help to have jessica do this uh, i want to welcome sally from out of town who's still a member and still interested in in what's going on here and thank you for that for coming thank you to all of you um we do have coming up in august and now of course the date escapes me donna maybe you remember or Lorna, you're involved of the health study that we're doing. This is a, for the commissioners, if you're interested, this is a statewide study through the league about our health equity uh, throughout the league. And, and we'll be having that coming up. We have a lot of, a lot of us have to do a lot of study before the time. Um, do you remember the date on that? Is it the 14th? You're, 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 um, I you're think finished. the 5th. Yes, 5th. Okay. It's the 14th? No, it's August 5th. August 5th. August 5th, and we are going to be doing that one in the evening so that um, we do have a few new members that most of the former members are all retired. We're all getting old. We're, we are old. Uh, but we have some new members coming in that, that are still employed because they're younger. So we, uh, we scheduled that one for an evening, I think, from 7 to 8.30. That'll be another Zoom study that night. So members study your health thing the health equity information that's been sent out there's a lot that get it studied and be ready for that and again we we thank we thank the commissioners for this we look forward to this every year a lot of good information yeah so thank you all and at that i think we can all leave and let the meeting be over thank you great thank you, thank you. Thank you.